We all know what it's like to try to impress someone. There's been times in our lives when there is a need to try to impress someone. In fact, just for fun, I just kind of Googled uh, things like trying to impress people, and the first thing that comes up is usually something like this, 10 ways to impress a woman. And so that's what's listed, and so there's lots of different ways um, to do that. And you know what it's like. You know what it's like to try to impress someone, that there's a need uh, to impress sometimes. And we even have phrases like, oh, they are dressed to impress, or she's dressed to impress, or he's dressed to impress. We know what it means to be impressive. We know what it's like to see someone that's impressive. You meet someone, you hear them, you're, you're in the room with them, you see how they carry themselves, you see what they talk about, you see their knowledge, and, and sometimes you may have a conversation with someone after you've met them and you go, wow, they were really impressive. We know what it's like to try to impress people. Now, being impressive or trying to impress people in and of itself is, there's not a problem with that. Uh, the only time that it becomes a problem is if we begin to uh, worship. Are we trying to, to make this is the thing that I'm going to be about is impressing people? But that's no good. But we, we want to be successful. We, we, we want to be good at our jobs. We, we want to uh, have a healthy life. In fact, Jesus says that, that there's going to come a time when, when he's probably either going to say, depart from me, I never knew you, or well done, my good and faithful servant. Well, if he's saying, well done, my good and faithful servant, then that means that you've done some things that are impressive, that, that you've surrendered to him and then chosen to live for him. So being impressive is in and of itself not a bad thing. But have you ever stopped and asked this question? Or maybe taking your journal and at the top of the page, of a blank page, just write this question. What impresses Jesus? What impresses Jesus? What causes him to go, that's impressive? Now we have an account in scripture where a, a Roman had great faith for Jesus to be able to, to heal one of his children. And this impressed Jesus greatly to the point where Jesus even said, he said, I'm impressed. I've never seen anybody in all of the land have such faith. So he was impressed by this. So we know that having faith impresses Jesus. Well, what else? What else impresses him? I think that we might be able to find an answer at the beginning of Matthew chapter five. And our text today is gonna be Matthew chapter five, verses one through 12. So if you wanna turn in your Bible or turn on your Bible or however you wanna do that to Matthew chapter five, verses one through 12. I wanna give a little bit of a, a setup to this. It's, it's, it's the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, it's called the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus didn't call it on the Sermon on the Mount. He didn't, you know, he didn't email one of the apostles on Wednesday and say, here's the sermon for Sunday and there's the title and make sure the slides are this. I mean, that's not what he did. The, the disciples didn't call it the Sermon on the Mount. Later on, when, when the Bible, as we know it, starts to be put together and we get chapters and verses and headings, then it's called the Sermon on the Mount. <clears throat> and these first 12 verses are referred to as the Beatitudes. It's a series of statements that Jesus makes that he says, blessed are you. Jesus is on the scene, so we gotta set the, the, the scene a little bit before we read this. And for some of you, this will be very familiar for you. For others, maybe not so familiar. But Jesus has been baptized. He's beginning his ministry as a rabbi. And he has announced that the kingdom of heaven is near. And he's saying, repent, because the kingdom of heaven is near. This is what he is announcing. And in our series that we started back in August on reflections, um, that has kind of morphed into stuff Jesus said. I don't know if you've noticed that, but that's kind of what this series has morphed into. On the second or third week, we looked at that phrase where Jesus says, repent, 
And we talked about the importance of repentance and how that's the beginning of everything. It starts there and he's, he's announcing this. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Now the people that he's talking to, he's talking to Jews and they're, they're looking for the Messiah. They're looking, they're looking for their savior. And there's been about 400 years since there's been no prophet. There's been nothing officially from God. And so in the absence of that, man makes stuff up. And that's what had, had been happening for 400 years. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, they just started making stuff up. And so they started coming up with all these rules and all these laws and all these commands. And they were impressive. If you were to meet in a, a Pharisee, you would go, he is impressive. He is dressed to impress. This is what they did. Now Jesus shows up, a carpenter from Galilee, and a redneck from Mississippi. He's probably not all that impressive. And he's saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. So people start to ask, well, am I eligible? Can I get in? Do I, do, I, do I have what it takes to be in this kingdom? I mean, do, do I get in? Am I good enough? No, that's not, a, that's not a strange question, right? I mean, today, there's a lot of people, especially people who come to church, who ask this question. How do I get into heaven? Am I gonna get into heaven? I hope I get into heaven. I think I'm gonna get into heaven by the skin of my teeth. I mean, there's all kinds of phrases that people say. So it's not, a, it's not a new thing, but they're asking, am I good enough? Can I get in? See, the Pharisees and the, the, the scribes, the leaders of the day, they had set this very high standard of all of, these, all of these hoops to jump through and all of this stuff to do. And Jesus is calling for repentance and he begins his first real teaching that we have in Matthew 5 is what we call the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is not a plan of salvation. That's not what it is. It's not a constitution for the kingdom. That's not what it is. This is what he's doing. This is what he's teaching. And by the way, this is not just something he preached once. Many scholars believe that this is what Jesus preached wherever he went. He just preached this over and over and over and over. And this is what he was teaching. He's teaching He's showing us this is how a person is. This is this, a person who is in right relationship with God, his life looks like this. And then he teaches the Sermon on the Mount. And then on the Sermon on the Mount, there's things that he was very specific about. If you're asked to go one mile, go two. If you're hit in the cheek, turn the cheek. I mean, so very specific things. Then there's some general things that he would say. He would think he had some general things in, in the Sermon on the Mount like this. Listen, you can't serve God and materialism. Can't serve both of those. And then there's some things he talked about the future. But at the very heart of everything that is in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is focused on the inward. Now, the Pharisees and the scribes were all focused on on the outward. They were dressing to impress. But Jesus is coming in and saying, I want to talk to you about your heart. I want to talk about what is in the inside. And we get these eight statements called the Beatitudes at the beginning on the Sermon on the Mount. So in Matthew chapter 5, starting with verse 1, when he saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, hence the Sermon on the Mountain. And after he sat down, and sitting down, a rabbi, it was very common for a rabbi to sit down. In fact, a rabbi would always sit down to teach. If it's an official teaching, he would sit down. So after he sat down, his disciples came to him. So a disciple would know that. They would see the rabbi. And if the rabbi sits down in kind of this kind of setting, it's like, oh, we got to go. He's got something he wants to say. He's got something that he's going to teach. Then he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the humble, for they will inherit their earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteous, righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. You are blessed when 
They insult you and persecute you and falsely say every kind of evil against you because of me. Be glad and rejoice because your reward is great in heaven for that is how they persecuted the prophets who were before me. So, so Jesus gives these eight statements and he says blessed and he gives eight things that you're blessed about and then there, there is a result. Like if you do this, then this happens. If this is what you are, then this happens. So there's, there's each one of those. Now the word blessed, sometimes we use the, ble- the word blessed. Your grandmother probably uses blessed more than you do. Uh, we have an expression in the South when somebody's really dumb, we say bless their heart. I mean, that's, that's just kind of what we do. And so, but what does Jesus mean by bless? Well, what's the word? Well, there's a lot of people written a lot of things about what exact, this word exactly means. And really, if you want to simplify it down, it comes to this. It comes down to either happy or fortunate. So happy are those who mourn. Happy are the peacemakers or fortunate for those who mourn. For, fortunate for those who thirst and hunger after righteousness. I, I personally like fortunate better than happy because happy comes with so many different um, things. But, but Jesus is saying, this is good. It's good if you're these things. Th- these things are impressive. If you're these things, if you're living life in this way, this is good. And like I said, he gives a, a benefit of it. Now, if we were coming up with our own beatitudes based on the world in which we live, they would sound probably something like this. Blessed are the hardworking Blessed are the intelligent. Blessed are the beautiful. Blessed are the proud. Blessed are the impressive. Blessed are the talented. Blessed are the rich. That's, that's probably how the world would write the Beatitudes. But Jesus is writing something and teaching something totally contrary to that. Like, no, it's a completely opposite of that. The first one, he says, blessed are those, fortunate are those who were poor in spirit. Notice he says poor in spirit. Poor in spirit means this. It means consciously, if we're gonna put that slide up. I know it's there. There we go. Poor in spirit, consciously dependent on God. Poor in spirit doesn't mean poor in checkbook. Doesn't mean poor in savings account. Doesn't mean poor in, poor in investments. That's not what it means. He's talking about poor in spirit here, and that is consciously dependent on God. Now, let me ask an easy softball question. Who's dependent on God? So it's not so easy, huh? Who's dependent on God? Everybody. Everybody's dependent on God. If the sun, if the earth stops rotating, around the sun, who's got a problem? Everybody, okay? So we're all dependent on God. Notice what the key word here is, consciously. Blessed are you, fortunate are you, happy are you if you are consciously dependent on God. If you are consciously aware of your dependence on God. And what is the reward? I'm gonna ask this eight times. The answer is in your Bible every time. The kingdom of God is yours, okay? So remember what they're asking, can I get in? Am I good enough to get in? What does it take to get in? And he's saying, listen, if you are consciously dependent on God, the kingdom of God is yours. This, This is so important for us to be consciously dependent on God, not consciously dependent on our own efforts, not consciously dependent on our intelligence, Intelligence, not consciously dependent on the country we live in, not, con- not contra- consciously, no, none of that. Be consciously dependent on God. I grew up in an independent Baptist church in Mississippi where it was hellfire and brimstone every week, every week you needed to get saved because there was a Mack truck that was going to run you over <laughs> and you needed to make sure that you had repeated this prayer after me. We got, a pre- we got a new pastor about every two years. I think it was because they ran out of sermons, so they had to go to somewhere else. But about every two years, we got a new pastor. And I can go through pastor after pastor in my childhood, in my junior high, my uh, high school days, 
regardless of who the pastor was. And I can remember, they all did this. They talked about the one thing that would send more people to hell than any other thing. And they always held up their hand and they always spelled it out. And it was P-R-I-D-E. Pride. Pride is what keeps people from trusting God. I got it. I can figure it out. I'm different. The rules don't apply to me. That might apply to you, doesn't apply to me. That's why blessed are those who are poor in spirit, who consciously are dependent on God. Pride is so destructive. And we have to do everything we can to fight against it. This is why this first beatitude that Jesus starts with, this is the first thing that he says in the sermon, the, the thing that he knows, the first thing. He's saying, listen, you've got to be consciously depend, dependent on me. Is there any wonder why if you're going to be a faithful Christian, you must practice praying every day? You must practice reading scripture every day. You must practice generosity every day. You must practice giving forgiveness every day. It's why the daily practices are so important. It's why we gather to worship corporately. We're to be reminded that God is God and we are not because we forget. Blessed fortunate or the poor in spirit. The second one, he says, blessed are those that mourn. He's not talking about grief. He's not talking about grieving because someone died or because something was lost. Mourn here means recognize the needs and present them to God. Recognize that I have needs. And it's, I'm fortunate when I recognize that I have needs and I present them to God. Now the place that I have to start is I have to recognize my pending death problem. I have to recognize the fact that I have sin and that sin must be taken care of. That's the greatest need you have. Once that's done, then there's other things to talk about. But he's saying, listen, for, for you're blessed, you're fortunate, it's happy when you recognize needs and present them to God. Life is hard, you know that. Life is difficult, you know that. Life is not for the weak. And life is hard, so we're constantly looking for comfort. You constantly look for comfort. And by the way, the reason you look for comfort is because you were, anybody know? Why are you always looking for comfort? Because you were created for paradise. You were created for comfort. You were not created. You and I were not created for chaos. We were not created for evil. That is not how we were created. So we are always trying to get back to the garden. And what Jesus says, I've come, and I've come to get this so you cannot, you won't go back to the garden because I'm going to build a garden city and you're invited into that kingdom. And this is what we're after. But I have to recognize that and I have to call on that and I have to say, listen, God, this, I need, I need this. I need you. I need your love in this day. I need your direction in this day. I need your knowledge. I need your wisdom. I need your grace and your mercy. The Apostle Paul, every letter he wrote to the church starts with, he's praying that they would receive grace and mercy and peace. I recognize if you don't know what your problem is, you can't solve it. Y'all got that? If you don't know what your problem is, you can't solve it. And for most of us, we spend our entire life solving problems we don't really have. See, the biggest problem you got is not your inability to impress people. That is not the biggest problem you got. The biggest problem we have is that we are not living in the way that God has designed us and we have to recognize that and present it to him. Do you, do you see what the reward is here? Do you see what the result is for this one? I said I was gonna ask it to you eight times, so look in your Bible. What's, what's, what's the reward for the second one? What? You will be comforted. You'll be comforted. 
You remember the last couple of weeks, if you've been paying attention or if you've listened the last couple of weeks, we've talked about if I choose not to, to follow Jesus, if I choose not to deny myself, if I choose not to take up the cross and follow him, I will be unsatisfied because I'm chasing stuff that doesn't satisfy. And the only way I can be satisfied is when I begin to understand that I am so dependent on God and that I recognize what my real issues are and I present them to God. And when I begin to do that, he begins to comfort me. What does it take to impress Jesus? Well, what does he say? This is what an impressive life looks like. The third one, he says, blessed are the humble, for they will inherit the earth. Humble. Some of your translations may say gentle, or it may say meek. It's to understand my position. When I am humble, I understand my position. When you are the leader and you're supposed to lead and you're not leading because you don't recognize your position, that's a problem. When you're not the leader and you try to lead, you don't recognize your position. Fortunate is the one who understands their position. Who am I? How is God? A gentle, meek. The definition, a great definition for meek, for humble. These words are a lot of times used interchangeably, even, even, in, the, even in the New Testament. And it, it's strength under control. Jesus doesn't want you to be weak. He's not called you to be weak and wimpy. That's not, that's not what it is. But he is calling us to be gentle and to, be, and to be, have strength under control. I remember having breakfast with a, a guy one time who was, he's an interesting guy uh, because of his, his livelihood. Um, he got paid to beat people up legally. He wasn't in the mafia or anything like that. He's an MMA fighter. He's, he was impressive. Um, he could probably take out this whole section. I mean, he was impressive. And I remember having a conversation with him over breakfast one time. And he was talking about how he met his wife and, and talking about, you know, kind of their non-negotiables when they were in their, starting in their relationship. And hers was, don't you ever dare cheat on me. That's understandable, right? Right, ladies? All your ladies are going to agree with that. This is what he said. He says, what I have told her is please do not ever confuse gentleness with weakness. Please never confuse gentleness with weakness. I was like, wow, that's good. He didn't know he was quoting Jesus from the Beatitudes, but that's what he was doing. Be humble, understand our position. You've been called to add value. There's, there's a place for you to add value. There's a proper place for you to add value. You've got to find that proper place. And when we do that, what's the reward? You will inherit the earth. See, when I find and when I operate in my proper place, life goes well. When I try to be somebody I'm not, life doesn't go so well. Fourth one, he says, blessed, happy, fortunate are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. A hunger and thirst for righteousness and hunger and thirst for this righteousness, this is a spiritual appetite to hunger and thirst for the things of God. Not the things of the world, but the things of God hunger and thirst for the things that matter. And what's the reward? 
You'll be filled. There's that satisfaction thing again. I'll, I'll be filled. I'm hungering when I, when, I, when I seek after the things of God. So when is Jesus impressed? When you seek after the things he seeks after. When is Jesus impressed? When you love the things he loves and loves the people that he loves. And by the way, that means all people. That's when he's impressed. That, that's, that's when I will have real satisfaction when I'm after what is real. The fifth one is blessed are, are the merciful for they will be shown mercy. Merciful means to extend mercy. What's mercy? One person, not eight of you. Can and one person feel confident they can give me a good definition of mercy? You raise your hand. Unmerited favor, that's more grace. Yes, all the way in the back. Okay. She's right. Mercy is not giving somebody what they deserve. That's what mercy is. A policeman pulls you over. I use this illustration all the time. A policeman pulls you over for speeding because you were, and he lets you off with a warning. He showed you mercy. A policeman pulls you over. You weren't speeding. You didn't do anything wrong. He pulls you over and wants to give you a $100 bill for being such a good driver. He's extending you grace. And Jesus says, happy are those, fortunate are those who extend mercy. That, that we are not out trying to give everybody what they deserve. We all love receiving mercy but we struggle giving it. I mean, I'm gonna give you a real simple way that we don't give mercy. I told you so. I told you so. You ever say that? You ever tell somebody that? What would happen if we replaced I told you so with let me help? Even though you already told them and they didn't listen the first time or the second time or the fourth time. Remember Peter? Peter's like, geez, Jesus, how many times do we have to forgive? I mean, how many times do I got to put up with this guy? I mean, is it seven times seven and is it 49? And Jesus says, oh, no. Jesus gives him back an, in, an infinite number. What happens when I extend mercy? I'm shown mercy. Seems to be a big deal for Jesus. The next one, verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. Blessed are the pure in heart. What does pure, heart, pure in heart mean? It means forgiven with ongoing repentance. And this is the part a lot of times that we get confused about. This is why I'm passionate about you being a part of pure heart and being a part of going to pure heart weekend to the point where you can start teaching it to your children. Because if you can't teach it, you don't know it. If you've gone to the cross and you've surrendered to Jesus, you are forgiven. Everything is forgiven. Past, present, future. You're forgiven. You are a new creation. Now, you're still a screw up. And I'm still a screw up. And I still do stuff I shouldn't do. And say things I shouldn't say. And there's things I should be doing. Those things I need to repent of. Someone who's pure in heart knows they are pure in heart. They know they've been forgiven. They know they're in right relationship with God. When the apostles ask Jesus, teach us how to pray, what's the first line? 
What's the first line of the Lord's Prayer? Our Father who art in heaven. The first line of that prayer is not, Woe is me. You don't know who I am. The first line of that prayer is what? Our Father. Pure in heart, I'm forgiven. I know I'm forgiven. It's huge to know that we are in that and the reward is you'll see God. Now, does Jesus mean that once you understand that you're forgiven, you're going to see an old man sitting on a throne with a really long beard and really long, and he's holding a staff? No, no, no. He's saying you're going to know God. You're going to experience God. You're, you're, this is what you're going to be. You're going to hear, and I hear it all the time from people who are Christians who are at least professing to be Christians, and you don't hear from God. Why? Maybe it's because you don't know him. Because if you're pure in heart, you hear him. My sheep hear my voice. It's just the things that Jesus says. So if you don't hear him, you don't hear the positive or the negative. Something's wrong. And maybe you are pure in heart. But you're just so busy, you can't hear him. But when I know I'm pure in heart and I live that, I hear from him. And then, blessed are the cheesemakers. <laughs> A few of you get that. It's not blessed are the cheesemakers. It's blessed are the peacemakers. For they will be called sons of God. Peacemaker means show others how to have peace. Show others how to have peace. Blessed are the peacemakers. Show others how to live in peace. Show others how to live in me. Show others how to be confident in me. Blessed are you who do that. This does not mean blessed are those who stop conflict. How many conflict haters? Got any conflict haters? I ask this all the time. I'm a conflict hater. I hate conflict. I'll run in the opposite direction. I'll pretend it doesn't happen. I'll cover up stuff. I have been known to lie just to get out of the conflict. All right? That's not what Jesus is talking about. He's saying, blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the people who, who show people how to have faith. I talked about Paul and Silas last week. And they're in the dungeon. And they've been beaten and stripped and changed to a dungeon. And they're sitting in their blood and everything else that comes along with being chained to one spot. And what are they doing? They're singing praises to the Heavenly Father. And who's listening? The jailer's listening. He's heard a lot of prisoners. He's heard a lot of cursing. He's heard a lot of wailing. But this time he's hearing praises. So he's already thinking, what's up with these guys? And then there's an earthquake. And the chains are loosened. And the doors are open. It's their time to escape. It's their time to run. To run from the conflict. To run from the stuff that's not peaceful. And what do Paul and Silas do? They stay. Now why did they stay? Because they knew if they left, the jailer would lose his life. Now there's an interesting thing in this story. When the jailer comes down, he expects everybody to be gone. Not only did Paul and Silas stay, 
All the other criminals stayed. And the jailer looks at Paul and Silas and says, I want what you got. I want what you got. Blessed are the peacemakers. For they will become what? Sons of God. So the jailer is looking at Paul and Silas and going, sons of God. And then the last one, blessed are those that are persecuted because of righteousness. And righteousness is simply be about what is true. Here's a great question to ask on a daily basis. Is this truth based on the Jesus way? Is this truth based on the Jesus way? And what's the reward when I focus on righteousness? I'll be in the kingdom. Isn't it interesting that the first one, the reward, was to be in the kingdom? And the last one, reward, is to be in the kingdom? And what was the people's biggest question? Can I be in the kingdom? And Jesus says, yeah. You can be in the kingdom. You repent. And oh, by the way, when you repent, this is what your life should look like. Let's pray. Father, your truth, not ours. May your name be glorified. Amen.